the most obvious way to extract the energy from the sun is to use the solar radiation. And this is a huge energy input on the order of about 10 to the 5 terawatts striking the Earth's surface. About uh, less than 1,000 is usable due to mountains, oceans, and so forth. And we are only using about a fraction of that even by 2050. So this is a very abundant energy source. However, the sun is not without its problems. It only shines about half the time, and it doesn't shine everywhere. Even if you think about a state like Texas, for example, how many people from Texas? Do you see sun all the time? Yeah. Eh, maybe not in the summer when there are thunderstorms and so forth. So when you have loss of solar coverage, then you have the problem of solar electricity ending very quickly. Okay? If you have cloud coverage, your power can drop by 80% in a matter of a few seconds. So this is one big driving force for establishing a way to store the electricity that we generate for renewable sources like the sun. Wind has exactly the same problem. If the wind doesn't blow all the time, if the wind stops blowing, then you have to have other, what we call peakers, uh, uh, coal-fired power plants, in order to make up for the demand. So if you look at some of these uh, control centers for uh, power generation, they're actually watching weather patterns. And they say, oh, the big of gush wind is coming from the Rocky Mountains, so we need to cut down generation for coal fire. But if there's no wind, we have to boost up the coal fire. So the ability to store electricity, even briefly, maybe on the order of a day, will make a huge difference when it comes to realizing carbon neutral energy. The second driver is human mobility, more specifically, sustaining it. Okay? So if you look at a lot of the developing countries, they're striving to be more mobile. You think China, India, and so forth. But of course, kind of a funny thing, if you look at a lot of the developed countries, we're becoming a little bit less mobile. So this is the contradiction in its own, but everybody wants to be mobile. And we need to have a way to be mobile without causing damage to the environment. So obviously, in this sense, using electricity is one of the best ways. It has no byproduct. We don't make CO2. We don't make water, not at the point of use. So if there's a way to pipe renewable electricity from the sun or from other sources to mobile applications like electric vehicles, then we can have human mobility without all the environmental impacts. So I would say that these two factors, realizing carbon neutral energy and sustaining human mobility is what's really mobilizing us to develop storage technology to take something from the sun all the way to mobility, all the way to energy. So let me go into a few specific cases, uh, technical aspects to why this is a problem. This is uh, a grid load balancing application. This is a power uh, generation curve in California one day in 2013. 2000, 2013. And this shows basically as a function of the time of the day, how much generation from the grid do we need? Okay, so this does not include the renewables. So this is from nuclear, from coal fire, other sources. And what you can see is if you follow the curve for 2013, it's pretty flat, but it goes up around 6 p.m., okay? And the reason is because we come home at 6 p.m., and in March, uh, you may be turning on appliances. If you go to August, you'd be turning on ACs and so forth. And it causes a huge spike. Uh, it's on the order of about 10,000 megawatt. More additional power is needed across a three-hour period. Then you go to nighttime, this is midnight, and then it goes down. But what's really interesting is if you forecast down into the future, so from 2013 to 2020, that's only, say, four years from now, then there's a huge dip. And this is known as the duck curve. That looks a bit like a duck with the head on the right. And what is happening here is that there's so much renewable by 2020, uh, mostly solar panels in California, that you actually don't need to generate that much electricity anymore. So this sounds like a good thing, but it's actually a really bad thing. I don't know if there's already a talk mark on grid, uh, or will be a talking grid. This is a big problem. You're suddenly cutting in half of the demand for electricity. Electricity is conserved, so you, can, you have to generate exactly how much you need. Okay? So when you have a boost of renewable coming out, then you have to dip your non-renewable sources in order to get the grid stable. This is the problem of storage. If we are able to have some way to move all of these excess electricity to the nighttime, so the night time, the generation is quite low, but what if I'm able to reduce the generation required overnight? 
What if I'm able to basically make up for this giant requirement using something like a battery in order to provide transient electricity without having to turn on a coal-fired power plant or natural gas power plant? This is one of the biggest driving forces right now, and I will show here in the next slide how big the problem is. This is a legislation passed uh, two years ago by the Public Utility Commission in California that mandates the installation of electrical energy storage on the grid. Okay? It requires non-hydro, so the classical way of storing electricity is to pump water up an elevation, and then you pump uh, you flow it down to generate electricity when you need it. This is the classical way, but of course, if you calculate the potential energy, MGH, is not much, and you need a huge amount of space, and you need water. So the legislation requires a 2 gigawatt of power installed by 2020. So 2 gigawatts sounds like a lot, it's not a lot. Remember the figure I showed earlier on the slide, it's in terawatts, okay? So we're still off by three orders of magnitude, but this is a start. To show you how big of an improvement this would be, this is where we were at in 2015. We're on the order of just a few tens of megawatt installed. And the legislation requires us to go to 2 gigawatt in 2020 in three to four years. So this is one of the integration with policy trying to get us to look at storage more closely. The second motivation, as I mentioned, is mobility. And because we're Silicon Valley, we always make an example of the Tesla. Okay? So why can't everybody afford a Tesla is the question I'm going to get at in a bit. Energy density, power density, and cycle life are three characteristics of any battery system. When translated to electric vehicle, energy density means range. How far can you drive? Okay? And in today's Tesla, if you don't use your AC and you have a relatively warm area, you're looking at about maybe 250 miles of range. But if you are in Detroit, for example, then you're looking at 150 miles because you have to keep the battery warm and you have to turn off the heater in the car. Power density more specifically talks about the recharging time. Okay. How many of you um, come from a place in which you don't have a garage? You have to park your, a car somewhere out. Yeah, there's a good fraction of you. So if you don't have a garage, you can't have a charger. And if you can't have a charger, you can't charge your car. Now, if we install a charger in every single parking booth, that would be great. But the recharging time, typically, for an electric vehicle is on order of many hours. Okay? If you come from China, for example, it would be hard to find a parking spot to park for that long unless it's overnight. Okay? And even if it's overnight, it's really hard to find that spot. So the ability to recharge your car faster, say in 15 minutes or 30 minutes, will allow you to fill up the car just like you would for an internal combustion engine when you put the gasoline in the car, and then you're ready to go. The last one, and I put this in the box, is because it's the most important one, it is the cycle life. How many times can you recharge the car? Now, for an internal combustion engine, recharging is not a problem. You can essentially fill the tank infinitely many times. The, the nozzle doesn't degrade, the tank doesn't really degrade, the engine maybe has a bit of a problem with life, but the filling process is not an issue. But for batteries, the recharging cycle life is a huge issue. How many, of you, how many of you change iPhones or smartphones when the battery dies? No, that's not even more than that. I know I do that. When my, phone, when my battery fails, I know it's time to change phones. I don't actually replace the battery. I just get a new phone. So this is one of the biggest problems of batteries. Uh, for a portable electronic, it's maybe about 1,000 cycles. You can be charged 1,000 times. For a car, battery is about 3,000 times. What I want to show you now is a comparison to where we should be at. Okay. These two plots uh, shows you uh, the power purchasing agreement for solar and wind electricity. So these are renewable sources. And it basically shows um, nowadays, so this is in 2015, we're approaching around 20 cents per kilowatt hour for solar and for wind. All right. Let's do some simple math. What does this translate to for the cost of storage? So if I'm generating at 20 cents, in a few years you'll be generating at 10 cents, and in a few more years you'll be generating probably below 10 cents. So the storage should cost no more than the generation, if possible. Okay? 
So let's put a metric here. I would like to store at the same price as generation 10 cents per kilowatt hour. A typical uh, 250 mile range of electric uh, car, like the Tesla, is about 100 kilowatt hour of battery. You're at 10 cents per kilowatt hour. And I would like to charge my car 500 times. So how do I get that number? Well, if you're driving 300 miles each trip, times 500, that would give you 150,000 miles. That's roughly above the warranty of the car market. Is it 100,000 miles for warranty? Or something like the warranty of that. Mark, Mark has a Tesla. Um, so. <laughs> now everyone has a field trip on Thursday. Now everyone has a So if you take these three number, 500 cycles, at 100 kilowatt hour per cycle, 10 cents per kilowatt hour, it gives you 5,000. <coughs> okay. So this is roughly how much the battery should cost if the energy storage cost will be commensurate with the generation cost. How much the fuel cost, right? Uh, over the lifetime of the car. We are about six times this number right now. Folks are trying to get down to four times. Okay, but we're still four times. So I would like to pose that question. If an EV car right now can charge for, say, 3,000 cycles, okay, realistically, what if it can charge for 10,000 cycles, 30,000 cycles? If you can charge for 30,000 cycles instead of 3,000 cycles, you can go ahead and divide this number by 10. It's not good for the car manufacturer because basically you don't have to make more batteries. When you sell a car, the battery is stupid. The reversibility of a battery is primary problem. Batteries are supposed to be rechargeable, but they're not really that rechargeable. You recharge them over several thousand times. But what we really need is something operating on the order of computer chips. They can perform calculations billions of times without fail. Okay? So one of the big challenges we have for battery is getting the cycle life up because you amortize the cost of the battery over the number of times you can recharge it. Okay? So if we can get the cycle life up, we can make a huge difference even without changing the energy density nor the power density. You can argue today that energy density is not quite there, but we are getting close. But the cycle life, we're nowhere close to where we should be at. And I would say in the next 20 years or so, we will see battery back in cycle for tens of thousands of times rather than just thousands of times. And this will really change the business model because then when you sell a car, the battery's still good. What do I do with the battery? and I put it in another car. Okay, so we can start thinking. Tesla probably won't be very excited about that, but we'll see. So what is a battery? A battery is an electrochemical device. I know there is a, uh, you guys are from a wide range of backgrounds, so I keep it at a very high level. A battery has three components. An electrolyte, current collectors, and electrode. Battery is nothing more than a device that selectively transports ions, and electrons. What you do, for example, when you have lithium, is you have lithium ions reacting with electrons to forming lithium. And you do the reverse, that's how you store a battery, energy in the battery. So you have a, a low energy reservoir and a high energy reservoir, just like it has uh, electric air. Okay? You have high potential energy, low potential energy, and when you flow between the two, you can store energy. You have a high energy reservoir and you have a low energy reservoir, for example, for lithium. <coughs> However, if we are not able to separate the traffic of ions and electrons, they will just recombine, you will just make heat, you won't store energy. And what we have to do here is to have device a material that is selective to the transport of ions and the transport of electrons. So in this case, in blue, this material is selective to ions. And in gray, which are the current collectors, are selective to only electrons. So what happens is the ions flow inside, okay? This is like water flowing down and elevation difference. And then you have the electrons flowing outside, so this is like the generating turning, and then you have electrons flowing into the circuit. If you keep this two traffic of ions and electrons apart, you will be able to store energy. So, what is some of the key design trade-offs? It's always good to look at this because we know what we're trying to get to and what we're at. As I already mentioned, three of the main factors are the energy density, the cyclability, how many, how many times you can cycle, and then also the cost. You notice that cost and cyclability are inversely related, meaning 
If you have a battery back in cycle, many times the cost will go down, especially the capital cost of making the battery. What I put here is a several different battery technologies and also a comparison to internal combustion engine and fuel cell. For fuel cell uh, and internal combustion engine, you basically have the specific energy density of fuel, such as hydrogen, gasoline, and so forth, and you have incredible cyclability. Okay? You can continually to reuse the fuel without damaging it. However, for battery technology, we have three classes. The first class is what is known as an insertion reaction. The mobile species, often lithium in commercial batteries today, were basically moving lithium between two reservoirs. So one way to do it is to stop the lithium in something else. In your cell phone laptop, you have lithium cobalt oxide and graphite, and these materials take up lithium into the material without massively changing its shape, size, and so forth. The problem is that you have to carry a lot of dead weight because you have to have a host to store those ions, and that puts a specific energy density quite low. But because it's a very simple quasi-reversible reaction, you're able to do this in and out many thousands of times, and this is what we're using today. Now, if we want to boost the energy density, what we can do is, well, why do we allow the material to change massively? Rather than just putting a little bit of lithium for a big host, what if we put a lot of lithium? Okay? So for insertion reaction, we're often only putting one lithium, say, for one molecular formula weight of the host. But what if we put five lithium? Power formula weight, and this becomes what we call the reconstitution reaction, where we are reconstituting the battery every time we charge and discharge. So we're making a new material, and then we're taking it away each time. However, the specific energy goes up, but the cyclability goes down because we're massively changing the morphology, the shape, the size of the material, and it's basically a nightmare when it comes to, say, mechanical engineering of the material. Then we can go to what's called the deposition growth reaction. What if we don't have a host at all? What if we just have lithium? Okay? We can just deposit lithium directly in the metallic form. We have no host. That means you're getting every bit of energy without anything being the dead point. And that is very attractive, but the problem is when you grow things like lithium, it often grows like dendrites. And these dendrites are very bad for safety and also for the performance of the battery. So why do you get extremely high energy density getting up to that of uh, fuels? But the cyclability is extremely poor. And when the cyclability is poor, the cost is very high. So how do we tackle some of these challenges? One of the ways we can deal with this is to up the cyclability without changing specific energy density. And the grand challenge that we need to address here is basically to tackle the transport of ions and electrons and batteries over a diverse range of length scale. In a battery, you have about nine orders of magnitude of length scale. All the way from centimeter in a double A-sized battery, all the way down to n-strom in the individual atoms and electrons and everything in between. You are straddling a device, macro, meso, atomic. There's virtually no other chemical technology that spans this range of length scale. And one of the things that we're doing at Stanford, uh, myself included, is to borrow a page from the Definitely break when you apply 1500 psi. 
So one of the major themes in battery engineering is how to eliminate the mechanical stress, especially when it comes to insertion uh, reactions. And this is just a movie. So this is what we see uh, in a post-mortem image, but this is what we see in a dynamic image. We now have the technology of working with folks at uh, Slide National Lab to actually image battery one particle at a time. So this is really breaking the length scale challenge. We're now at the length scale of submicron. Okay, so this is the mesoscale range I was talking about. And by understanding how degradation is happening, we have now the ability to rationally design batteries that go from 3,000 cycles to 30,000. My colleagues have also been working on alternative ways. For example, Professor Jenna Bao in chemical engineering has been looking at cell healing polymers to basically suppress the effect of the particles breaking. The battery breaking part, if you can hold it together, that will still be fine. And if you surround all of your active material with a cell healing polymer, you have an opportunity to do that. We can also use nanotechnology. Uh, this is an example from Professor Yi Chui's lab in my department, where he's looking at how to use pure lithium. As I mentioned, pure lithium is great, but it grows like dendrite sharp pins that will penetrate the battery. But what if you put the lithium metal in a thin container? Not very heavy, not very massive. You can, for example, insert lithium into the layers of graphene sheets. And he showed that it's possible to completely eliminate the growth of dendrite, having this very uh, light, very low volume post to hold the battery. And you have the opportunity to increase the energy density further by another factor of 10. So this will really help you to move up this particular trade-off this way. Okay? So with understanding the degradation process and putting cell healing materials, you can push up the cyclability with nanotechnology, we can also increase the specific energy density. But how do we get off the clock? Okay? This is probably the most interesting question is can we get away from this? One of the common things of what I've been describing to you is all battery material involves some sort of solid. You're inserting lithium into a solid, you're growing lithium then, right, which is a solid. Okay? And solid is tough to work with, that's why you have mechanical stress. What type of matter doesn't have mechanical stress? A fluid. Okay? And that's what we've been looking at as well. There are several groups at Stanford looking at this, is to use a liquid-based battery. Okay. Folks have already been doing this for many, many years. Um, in the 70s, uh, GE commercialized um, a high-temperature liquid metal battery. So imagine solder. Okay. Solder is a liquid metal. You melt it at about, say, 200 uh, or so Celsius, and then it becomes fluid. If it's fluid, it means it can regenerate itself with a pump. Okay. So if it goes out of whack, we pump a little bit of it, things come back to normal. But the problem is you have to go to very high temperature and keeping a battery hot is uh, a very big uh, loss mechanism for efficiency. On the other hand, we can also use a water-based flow battery. This is great because we can go to room temperature. But one tricky thing with water is only stable up to a voltage of 1.23 volts. I think Thomas had already mentioned this as well. So you can have a battery that is more than 1.23 volts. A lithium-ion battery today is close to 4 volts. Okay. So automatically, you have a 3x energy penalty. One thing that we are looking at in my lab is actually merging the two. We develop a room temperature liquid metal. So it is a liquid at room temperature. So you're able to have the flexibility and the high voltage of a liquid metal without having the issues of a flow value based on water. So if you take a look here, these four uh, redox couples show you the voltage of a flow battery in water, so it's about one volt or so. But if you go to a liquid metal battery, you can go to four volts. So automatically, you're getting a three-fold enhancement in the energy density just from the voltage boost. And this is a picture of the liquid metal uh, working in the battery. So it's nothing like what you would imagine for a battery. A battery, you think of as a solid state device. But actually, if you take away that constraint and go to liquid, you can solve many of the degradation problems. So these are just a few examples of what we're working on at Stanford and SWAC. Uh, hopefully give you a bit of an introduction. Uh, e, I think, will give a, a more detailed lecture uh, this afternoon, so we'll tell you more about how nanotechnology is solving the battery problem. And then to circle back to the original motivation. Energy storage can really enable human mobility and a carbon neutral energy scheme. And this, actually, are two of some of the biggest problems we have in the world today. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so people talk about it a lot, like, if we 
get to $100 a kilowatt hour or whatever, then battery powered vehicles become competitive with IC vehicles. Why is cycle life not really talked about in the popular conception of that? And why don't we talk about like energy throughput instead of capacity? Yeah, so the question is, there's a lot of talk about uh, the cost per kilowatt hour, but there's no talk about the cycle life. Well, the cycle life is really how that $100 comes from, right? It's how the energy, how the cost is amortized into the technology. So it is indirectly included. So that's the big X factor there. So if you, so it's very hard to, even increasing the energy density by 30% is challenging. But increasing the life by 30% could be easy. And that's the argument I'm making here today, is maybe what we need to do is, rather than just simply improving energy density, we should look at improving the life of that. What's the question here? Yes? Um, how competitive is the NAS battery if you're working on right now with the mind for the fluid as well as the metal and the same one? Um, mm -hmm. Like, how competitive is it, like, cost-wise? How competitive? Yeah. It's cost-wise. Well, the person who's working is right behind you. Um, this is always a tough question for academics like myself, is, is it going to be viable? The short answer is, we don't know. We can do the calculations we want, but until we make a fairly large device, maybe on the order of a few kilowatt hours, we won't know the actual cost. So at a university, we can try to understand the fundamental mechanism, whether there's any showstopper. We can make techno-economic analysis but we won't know. So I'll be honest with you. It's very hard to know ahead of time. But you do some bad environmental calculations and it's within that window of opportunity. And the bar is actually not that high because present technologies are rather expensive. But we're not looking at only beating the present technology. We're actually looking into approaching what, say, internal combustion engine can do. So I think you need to look at also the pipeline of innovation beyond the university to see where true impact might be. But we at the university need to be aware of what may be down the road, and we prepare ourselves. Yes. Uh, the energy density of this segment battery is high, and the power density of super capacitor is very high. Yes. And uh, uh, the cycle life of fuel cell is even unlimited. So, uh, is, uh, is it possible to combine all these technologies in one single uh, electrical vehicle? Right. So the question is, um, electrical devices like a capacitor can deliver a huge amount of energy quickly, but uh, it doesn't have the capacity of a battery. And a battery cannot deliver that much amount of power, but you can do so for a long time. Can we marry the two? The answer is yes. Why do capacitors work so well? Capacitors work well because the transport of ions and electrons in those devices are extremely quick. So one thing that you can try to do is to increase the recharging time, to decrease the recharging time of battery, is to make batteries more capacitor-like. Okay? This can be done via nanotechnology. This can be done from a catalysis perspective. How do you get lithium to go from a liquid to a solid more quickly? So it is possible today to realize battery technology that approaches the power density of capacitor within a factor of 10. Okay? But the, the question here is, what do we need? Do we need to recharge our car in 10 seconds? Probably not. Okay. Do we need to discharge our car in 10 seconds? Not, that's not needed at all. We typically discharge a car over several hours, right? Or even days. So there is a limit, but I think we are already there. Power density today for discharging, for using the battery, is good enough. Power density for recharging is not good enough, but we're within a factor of five. But capacitor can get to a factor of a thousand. So I think that's beyond the application requirement for mobility. But I think that will be the last question. I would like to thank you for your attention, and I look forward to meeting all of you.